This is the history of the Whiting Sawmill. It begins in Connecticut in 1785. Elisha Whiting Jr. was born to Elisha Sr. and Susanna. Elisha's father died when he was very young and his mother Susanna, not knowing what else to do, bound her son Elisha out to an old Quaker who was very cruel. He eventually ran away to Lee, Berkshire County, Massachusetts, where he worked for a wheelwright and learned carpentry skills. Although Elisha detested his situation, he learned to value the trade and skills acquired during his apprenticeship, and these skills became part of the legacy he later shared with his descendants. From Ohio to Missouri and from Illinois to Utah, his sons and grandsons would eventually make wagons, chairs, and furniture for their own use and for market. This trying apprenticeship also prepared him and his family for the enormous demands of pioneering and migration beyond the frontier. While he was in Lee, Massachusetts, Elisha, age 19, met Sally Hewlett, age 17, and they were married September 18, 1805. They had their first six children while living in Lee, Massachusetts. Edwin was their third child and was born September 9, 1809. Elisha didn't have access to a sawmill as we think of it today, so he had to cut his own timber to have the wood necessary to make the chairs, furniture, and wheels that he produced. In 1816, Elisha and Sally Whiting, along with the extended Hewlett family, migrated to Nelson Township, Portage County, Ohio. Edwin would have been almost seven years old at the time. Ohio was the western frontier at this time and provided suitable timber to support his large family. Elisha built a double log house using one room to live in and the other for a wagon and carpenter shop. Their remaining six children were born here in Nelson, Ohio and Edwin attended school and was fairly well educated for his time. Sometime during the year 1830, Sylvester Hewlett, Edwin's uncle, went to Kirtland, Ohio, where he met Oliver Cowdery and other missionaries of the newly organized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Sylvester returned with a copy of the Book of Mormon. In May of 1830, the prophet Joseph Smith and Parley P. Pratt visited Nelson and bore testimony of the Book of Mormon. Sally Whiting was the first to be converted and was baptized October 29, 1830. When the prophet Joseph moved to Hiram, Ohio, he was only five miles from Nelson. This afforded the family many opportunities to come in contact with the prophet and several more members of the Whiting and Hewlett families were baptized. Edwin learned the carpenter trade of his father and also became a craftsman who made chairs, wagons, wagon wheels, and furniture. Edwin had a chair factory as did his father, Elisha Jr., and would have been involved in obtaining timber from the area. On September 21, 1833, Edwin, age 24, married Elizabeth Partridge Tillotson, age 19. For the next five years, they lived in Garrettsville, Ohio. This was about four miles from the family living in Nelson, Ohio. Their first three children were born there. After five years of marriage, Edwin and Elizabeth joined the extended family in Missouri and were baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Wherever Elisha Jr. or Edwin lived, they set up a chair shop. They established shops in Massachusetts, Ohio, Missouri, Illinois, Iowa, and finally in Utah. While in Yelrome, Illinois, an angry mob set fire to their home and chair shop and they were forced to move into Nauvoo. After moving to Nauvoo, Edwin married his second and third wives, Almira Meacham and Mary Elizabeth Cox. Edwin was sealed to his three wives in the Nauvoo Temple. In April 1844, Edwin was called to serve a mission to Pennsylvania. Along with preaching the gospel, he was asked to assist in Joseph Smith's campaign for President of the United States. He returned home sometime after the martyrdom of Joseph and Hiram Smith. Being experienced woodworkers and wheelwrights, the Whitings did much work to prepare the saints to leave Nauvoo. While living in Illinois, the Whitings were also very involved with the building of the Nauvoo Temple, and at least one of the beams for the temple was produced at the Whiting shop. Edwin sold a load of his chairs in Quincy, Illinois to purchase supplies for the trip west because they were driven out of Nauvoo. Elisha Jr. and his family settled at Mount Pisgah, Iowa, where they stayed for three years. 
The first thing Edwin and Elisha Jr. did was set up a chair shop. They had a regular market for their chairs and other furniture in Quincy, Illinois, which was about 250 miles away. In the evenings, the chair shop would often hold dances and socials. 1849, Edwin left Mount Pisgah to come to Utah. His parents, Elisha and Sally, had both died and most of his siblings were going to Minnesota with Alpheus Cutler. His sister Emmeline, who was married to Walter Cox, would be the only one immigrating to Utah with Edwin and his family. After arriving in Salt Lake City in 1849, the Whitings and Coxes were asked to settle in Manti, Utah. They arrived in Manti in November and built dugouts in the south side of the hill where the Manti Temple now stands. Edwin's dugout must have been crowded with his family of three wives and eight children and a chair shop. He immediately set up a foot lathe and went to work making chairs. To get the necessary wood, Edwin and his son William, then 15 years old, brought timber out of the mountains on a hand sled. As soon as they could get timber from the mountains, they began building log houses. Edwin built 100 chairs that winter and in the spring took them to Salt Lake for trade for supplies. They had no trouble selling their chairs. Edwin and his family spent 12 years in Manti. However, Edwin was gone for two years on a mission to the eastern states from 1854 to 1856. In 1861, Edwin got permission from Brigham Young to move his family to a climate more favorable for fruit production. The fruit trees Edwin brought from Ohio did not fare well in the cold Manti winters, so he pulled up roots again and relocated in the small city of Springville, 50 miles north. As Edwin's family grew, it became necessary to secure additional land for the sons to farm. He first homesteaded 160 acres on Union Bench, which is now known as Mapleton. He divided it among his older boys. As the younger boys grew up, he homesteaded more land in Hobble Creek Canyon. His land was in the left-hand fork of Hobble Creek, and this is where they built their first sawmill. In 1935, a monument was erected by Edwin's descendants marking the location of the homestead. The inscription on the monument reads, In memory of Edwin Whiting, pioneer, born September 9, 1809, died December 8, 1890, homesteaded this ranch in 1871, erected August 17, 1935 by his family. The Maple Creek Recreation Area is named Whiting Forest Camp. Edwin Marion was the fifth child born to Edwin and Mary Whiting. He was born August 8, 1857 in Manti, Utah. Edwin Marion learned many skills from his father. He learned the carpenter trade in the chair factory, the blacksmith trade in his father's shop, he learned to love tilling the soil by working in the gardens and orchards, and he learned how to keep bees. As the years went on, it was important to Edwin Marion not just to teach his children to work, but to like to work and to take pride in a job well done. In 1878, Edwin Marion made his first trip to Brigham City, Arizona at age 21. It was here where he met Anna Maria Isaacson and decided not to return to Utah as planned. In 1881, Edwin Marion and Anna Maria Isaacson were married and settled in Arizona, where they lived until 1888. When they returned to Utah in 1888, Edwin Marion used all his savings and bought a water mill to saw lumber. There were no other mills around and there was a lot of good timber on the mountains. When the stream went dry, they had to move the mill farther up the mountain. They built a shack at the mill and Maria cooked for the mill hands. They lived there until time for Ernest to be born in February 1889. Water power was not dependable enough, so Edwin Marion bought his first steam engine and boiler for the sawmill in Mapleton. He had to go into debt $450 to buy the steam engine. His brother Lute said that Edwin Marion would ruin the Whiting name going into debt for all of that, but his brother John thought better of it and went into business with him. With hard work and careful management, Edwin Marion was able to pay for the steam engine and boiler and buy out John's share of the business. They sold all the lumber they could to people who came to the mill to buy and took the extra to Provo and sold it for $12 a thousand board feet delivered. From the time Ernest was six, his father Edwin Marion assigned him the job of watching the steam gauges at the mill. 
Edwin Marion didn't trust some of the grown men who worked for him to do the job, but Ernest seemed to like the same things his father did and took the responsibility very seriously. Edwin Marion's brothers, John and Art, and others also helped run the mill. From an early age, Edwin Marion and Mariah's children worked together for their father and mother at innumerable unpaid tasks. All of Edwin Marion's children were taught that work was enjoyable and worthwhile. The boys became his business partners in numerous ventures until the time of his death in 1934 at the age of 77. After Mariah moved into town, Edwin Marion ran the mill a while longer up in the canyon. He would walk to town to be with his family over Sunday and then walk back up to the mill again. Finally, he moved the mill down to town and ran it there with the addition of a planing mill, which he bought. In spite of the success and happiness the family was experiencing in Mapleton, Edwin Marion felt he was supposed to return to Arizona and finish his mission. He sold his sawmill and other business interests and moved back to Arizona in 1901 with Mariah and their eight children. Upon returning to Arizona, they settled in St. John's, and he soon rented a little sawmill and cut lumber to build the store. A few years later, he homesteaded some timber land in the White Mountains. On May 5, 1911, the Forest Service of the United States Department of Agriculture issued a sawmill permit to E.M. Whiting and H.A. Berry, partners doing business under the firm name and style of Whiting and Berry having an office and principal place of business at St. John's, Arizona. The permit was for a steam-powered sawmill having a daily capacity of 5,000 board feet. A board foot, by definition, is a board one foot in length, one foot wide, and one inch thick. Some 75 years after the issuance of this original sawmill permit, the descendants of E.M. Whiting owned and operated sawmills and related lumber processing facilities having an annual capacity of approximately 150 million board feet. Edwin Marion built a sawmill a short distance above the homestead near the Little Giant Spring. The mill would be moved periodically to be closer to the timber. The last site is what we think of as the old Whiting sawmill. Edwin Marion, Ernest, and Jay Whiting loved to build sawmills and use the same method of planning. Most of the plans were only in their heads. If you were lucky, it was sketched on a napkin. There was a little stream that furnished the water for the camp as well as for the steam engine that produced the power to drive the log carriage. They had that little mill there. In about 1900, they called it, that's where they got the name, the Little Giant. They had the little old steam engine, they said it was the Little Giant, and that's where its name come from. They could get a board whittled off with it if they steam it up good. They would take it, you know, it was a, one with a firebox in the engine. And they'd build a big fire in that. And then they went out under the, you know how they're built with the flue sticking on out in the smokestack. And then they had a big firebox under that. And they'd build a fire all over that thing to give up <laughs> enough steam to run that mill. And then they called it the Little Giant because they could get aboard all with it. The sawmill life offered employment and work for the whole family and many others who came through the years to work for them. When the snow got too deep, they moved to St. John's for the winter, and as soon as the roads were passable, they would return to the sawmill. Edwin Marion and his son-in-law, Herbert Berry, owned the sawmill together. When Herbert decided to go to dental school, he sold his shares to Ernest, who had recently returned from his mission. Two years later, Ernest bought out his father. Ernest worked very closely with his older brother, E.I., who sold the lumber and helped buy machinery and needs for the sawmill. All of the other brothers were involved at times in logging, selling, and marketing the sawmill products. Marie Barry Hamblin described the mill houses as follows. The mill houses were all alike and were built to be moved later if necessary. They were about 12 feet by 20 feet and made of rough 1 by 6s with boards running vertical. Another round of 1x3s over the cracks made a fairly snug cabin. It had one big room for cooking, eating, and general living with a small pantry on the cool side. 
A big wood stove and cupboards ran along one wall, and a family homemade table with benches took up the rest of the room. The average mill house had an alcove or two for bedrooms. Only women with small babies brought rocking chairs. Built with no foundation, the roof was made by bending boards over the ridge pole put high enough to give the roof a slight curve down. Two layers of boards with the narrower boards over the cracks made a good tight roof and seldom leaked. Edwin, Marion, and Ernest could build a mill house in one day and move in by eventide. If you've ever seen Uncle Ernest drive an eight-penny nail with one blow, you wouldn't say it couldn't be done. I lived at the mill when I was a child and remember one time when Uncle Ernest started another new house. But strangely, there was no new family around that I could see. I wondered about that, but was too small to ask about it. I watched this house closely as it was going up. After it was finished, he kept on working on it for several days. He built a big chest for quilts and things and a tiny little cupboard for shelves besides a small shelf for knickknacks. In the bedroom, he built what he called a dressing table. I had never heard that word. One day, Uncle Ernest went off someplace and didn't come back for a long time, long enough for all us kids to miss him very much. When he came back, he brought with him a beautiful girl. She had big, dark, shining eyes, long, long dark hair, and the most flawless complexion you have ever seen. She was certainly the most beautiful woman at the mill. Burl turned it into a cheerful home with pictures on the walls, wildflowers on the table, and curtains at the windows. She continued to cook for the mill hands for 13 years until Ernest sold his shares to Eddie. Everyone loved to eat Burl's bread and beans, which she made fresh each day. Jay Whiting wrote the following about Edwin Marion's pocket watch and his emphasis on being punctual. Edwin Marion was one that wanted to start his sawmill on time and stop on time. It seems that while running his sawmill near the present homestead, he found that he did not have a dependable watch to start and stop the sawmill by. A salesman came by with this big beautiful Elgin Railroad pocket watch. Grandpa wanted the watch so he traded the man one of their milk cows for it. When he told Grandma, Anna Maria Whiting, about it, well, there was a mad little Danish woman. This did not change Grandpa's mind, and this was his timepiece for the mill while he ran the sawmill. This watch was given to Ernest when he purchased a sawmill from his father, Edwin Marion. It has since been passed on to Ernest's son, Ernest J. Whiting Jr., known as Jay, and now to Jay's son, Ernest J. Whiting III, known as Trey. To Edwin Marion, time was so valuable. He was one that believed that you should be on time in doing everything, including paying your obligations, going to church, and other social and family meetings. During the years the Whitings operated the sawmill, two tragic events occurred. Edwin Marion's brother, Charles, and his family had moved to Mexico. One summer, John, Charles' young son, came to Arizona and worked for Edwin Marion and his family at the mill. John was in a terrible accident. The saw cut across the middle of his body. In spite of all they could do, John died. This was such a sorrow to Edwin Marion and all his family that the mill was never quite the same again. The other incident was when Arthur, their youngest son, was bitten by a mad dog that belonged to some of the people who were working at the mill. Edwin Marion and Mariah took him to Los Angeles for treatments and were surely blessed as the treatments were successful and Arthur's life was spared. Those early days in Apache County were incredibly rugged by present day standards, yet it is doubtful that any family group ever had a greater measure of pure enjoyment. An enjoyment of people who deeply loved each other and helped instintingly in the accomplishment of mutual goals. Undoubtedly, though, the, the chief element in both the happiness and contentment of the early period and their later achievements was the towering love and respect that all the Whitings held for their parents, and the deep religious feeling that Anna Maria and Edwin Marion Whiting passed on to their posterity. After the death of Edwin Marion in 1934 and the death of his son Lynn 18 months later, the four remaining Whiting brothers, Eddie, Ernest, Ralph, and Art, continued to work together as a team.
Ever since Grandpa Edwin Marion had struggled over the Buckskin Mountains in northern Arizona, the family had looked longingly at the lush but remote Kaibab as a woodland bonanza. Early in 1945, the Whiting brothers bought a sawmill in Fredonia, Arizona from the Cutler brothers. They also bought a mill on the Kaibab owned by the Short Creek Group. When Jay Whiting returned from the Navy in December 1945, it was decided that he and his brother-in-law, Harold Bushman, would go to the North Kaibab and build some mills and do the logging for the mills already there. Whiting and Bushman Logging Partnership was formed. As soon as they could get into the mountains, they started building the sawmill in Lower Orderville Canyon. They also built a repair shop and 20 little homes for people who would be working at the mill and in the logging woods. The Whiting brothers also contracted to have a sawmill built in Upper Orderville Canyon as well. Because of the short logging season on the Kaibab, it was decided the next year they would build a sawmill just off the Kaibab in House Rock Valley. They would store logs during the summer at the House Rock Mill and cut them in the winter with the crews from the Orderville Canyon Mill. Logging methods were still pretty primitive and logs were skidded with horses. They bought some World War II surplus vehicles in hopes they would be useful in the woods. However, they didn't work as well as they had hoped. The half-track here at the homestead is one of those vehicles. They also bought some post-war trucks to haul logs to the Fredonia Mill. The high watermark of the Whiting family's lumber career came in 1950. The four Whiting brothers outbid all competitors for timber rights in a 250 square mile section of the Kaibab under U.S. Forestry Service control called the Big Saddle Cell. Mickey Whiting attended the famous bidding procedures with his father Art and recalls that memorable day. And I'll tell you what was ironic. They had looked forward to that sale and they had put got together enough money to do the bid. You had to have opening uh, bid money. When the couriers and their lawyer from Flagstaff showed up, what was ironic is couriers had been our biggest lumber customer up until then in Detroit. And they walked into that bidding room, that forest service, and there was Jerry Courier and his lawyer sitting there. By establishing their small sawmill operations on the Kaibab and in Fredonia, the Whiting brothers were ready when their opportunity arrived. With the contract signed, they built one of the most thoroughly mechanized mill facilities in the Southwest, an up-to-date woods operation, and purchased a fleet of trucks and other mobile equipment. The $1.5 million investment was soon paying off. The Whiting Brothers Kaibab Lumber Company was in full swing by 1952, harvesting a bumper crop from America's greatest stand of virgin ponderosa pine. Since then, they have worked wonders of woodmanship that gained national recognition. The Whiting Brothers were involved with many different business ventures, but their hearts were always close to the lumber business. At one time, they had sawmills in Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah with planing mills and concentration yards in Denver, Colorado, Flagstaff, Holbrook, Eager, and Fredonia, Arizona, and a plywood plant in Durango, Mexico. In 1953, Ralph Whiting and his family sold their interest in Kaibab and moved to Mesa. They later sold their Arizona interests and moved to Whitewater, Colorado. In 1958, Eddie Whiting sold his interest in Kaibab to concentrate on other business holdings. Eddie and his sons, Farr and Virgil, had businesses that were even larger than Kaibab Lumber Company. They had sawmills in Arizona and New Mexico, service stations, motels, the Ford Agency, and the cash store. Uncle Eddie and the family were devastated when his two sons were killed in a plane crash in 1961. After this terrible tragedy, a monument was erected to the memory of Farr and Virgil Whiting here at the homestead and dedicated in 1974. A year and a half later, Uncle Eddie Whiting died at the age of 80. Art and Ernest still owned the Kaibab Lumber Company, but soon turned over the day-to-day -day management to their sons, E.J. Whiting and Mickey Whiting. 
The Kaibab lumber business prospered for almost 50 years, but due to environmental activities and government red tape, they were forced to close the Fredonia Mill and all of their timber business in 1995. I became primarily involved in the, in the political process because it became more and more evident that the environmental pressures were going to cause us not to be able to continue to buy or harvest timber from U.S. Forest Service lands. In so doing, I became quite involved with the National Forest Products Association and spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. under three different presidents. That association was huge. It represented all of the lumber and plywood production in the United States and Canada. So it was no small task. And it was a very political effort and uh, Jay and I realized that there was going to come a day when the environmental pressures were going to cause us a problem in continuing in the lumber business. Well, that happened. We went on through uh, those years of the 40s and then the 50s and 60s. Uh, when the Endangered Species Act and the environmental legislation took hold, we gradually had to phase out of the lumber and timber business. Our large mill at Fredonia, Arizona, which was a, our crown jewel, we shut down, we shut down, I can't remember the date. It made national news and uh, we have many fond memories of what we contributed to southern Utah and northern Arizona and the Kaibab Forest. This was indeed one of the saddest days in the lives of Jay and Mickey Whiting and their families. No one could have imagined that the family legacy would end in such a senseless way. In spite of sawmill life ending, we are grateful for the lessons we learned along the way. We learned to love work and take pride in the job well done. We learn to work together and to love one another. We learn many lessons through tragedy and death, but most of all, we learn to love the Lord and know that we can do anything with His help. Thank goodness for the great memories and heritage that we have each been left with. Okay. The uh, Whiting family that had been in the lumber business around the homestead in that area for a year, few years, was out of the lumber business for many years. The uh, Edwin Whiting and then and the boys' sawmill ceased to function during those, that period of time. And it was only before World War II and then during World War II that the Whiting brothers got back into logging and lumber in any significant way. They, uh, the four brothers, E.I. the oldest, Ernest, Ralph, and Art, uh, were primarily engaged in, is primarily engaged in the garage and automobile and dealership and other ventures. And Lynn, whose health was bad, pretty much stayed in St. John's and was not an active partner in the Whiting Brothers' uh, efforts uh, during that period of time. As, they appro as World War II approached, it became evident that lumber was going to be needed for national defense purposes. And out of that came Whiting Brothers of St. John's, which E.I. Whiting, the oldest brother, and his two sons, Farr and Virgil, entered into with sawmills and interests in the White Mountain and close to the Homestead area. The other three brothers, Ernest, Ralph, and Art, moved to Holbrook and uh, 
primarily in the automobile dealership and the garage business and uh, independent gas stations, but they too had sawdust in their veins. And as uh, national defense needs became more apparent, they got into the sawmill business in uh, the Chevron Creek area south of Winslow and in Pinedale area. And uh, they once again were in the lumber business. During that time, uh, the timber sale that became available on the North Kaibab, known as the Big Saddle, came up for bid. I was there. And uh, this was a rare jewel as far as timber possibilities are concerned. The Whiting brothers had bought a small mill on the North Kaibab from the Cutler brothers. And uh, they had their foot in the door. And they also had purchased some smaller timber contracts on the North Kaibab, and they had a mill in House Rock Valley, close to where Aunt May Whiting would bury it. And uh, so they were somewhat exposed to the logging and lumber business. The big saddle timber sale was one of a kind. Uh, started out to be 150 million board feet and ended up being close to 300 million board feet that came from that area. I went with the Whiting brothers to Albuquerque for the bidding of that sale. All, uh, let's see, all three, three of the Whiting brothers were there, Eddie, Ernest, and Art. I don't think Ralph was there. They agreed to let Eddie do the bidding, and uh, I sat in as a bystander and watched it unfold, and it was it was the darndest poker game that I have ever seen played. And Uncle Eddie was the right one to play poker. The family out of Detroit, the Courier family, who we'd been selling lumber to, unbeknownst to us, had sent their son out to bid on the sale. And we ended up bidding against the Courier Lumber Company, a large company out of Detroit. And the Whiting brothers got together at, during the timeouts that occurred during the bidding process, but took nearly all day. And they finally decided they were going to buy that sale, regardless of how much it cost them. Well, when the day was over, they all gathered at the lobby of the Hilton Hotel and asked each other, my word, what have we done? How will we ever pay? They paid an exorbitant pie price for the timber. But fortunately, after they cut, I think it would have cut 25 or 30 million board feet of logs, then the timber would be reappraised. And so they said, we have to get together enough money to cut that first 25 or 30 million feet. And then the price will come down and we can make it. So they started selling everything they could think of. New cars, old cars, real estate, in order to pay the stumpage on that first 30 million board feet. And uh, at the same time, they had to get together enough money to build the a band sawmill at Fredonia. They had had a smaller mill there now, then. So, they really struggled. And this would have been right at the end of World War II. And they struggled to pay that stumpage price, which was several times over what it should have, they should have paid. And, uh, they stayed with it, outbid the couriers, and then it took a long period of time to, to build the mill. Jay Whiting and his brother-in-law, Harold Bushman, had been up there doing the logging for the small mill in House Rock and a small mill up in, by Jacobs Lake, but Whiting Brothers asked me to go to Fredonia and build, help build that mill. So that's when I moved from Holbrook 
to Fredonia, and uh, that was the beginning of Kayabab Lumber Company. Up until that time, their lumber enterprises had been known as Whiting Brothers, and uh, Uncle Eddie and his boys in St. John's was Whiting Brothers of St. John's. We organized Kayabab Lumber Company in 1952, which was a few years after the war, and uh, it, that was because of the name of the forest from which that timber came. And the name Kayabab uh, became well known throughout the industry over the years. The, uh, the mill took a while to build. Uncle Ernest was the primary brother in charge of construction. And uh, Art stayed in Holbrook trying to keep the money going to pay for the mill. And in that period of time, Ralph Whiting decided to get out to, to liquidate his interests with the Whiting brothers and get in the cattle business in Cal Colorado. So he was not only for a year or two, but uh, over the long haul, he was not a really an active partner in the timber enterprises. And he stayed in Colorado with his family for those many years. The, uh, the name Kayabab Lumber Company and then later Kayabab Industries became well known throughout the United States. Everybody was aware of it because the industry said, what did those crazy Whiting brothers have in mind to bid that amount of money on timber? And how are they going to absorb those losses? But they didn't know the determination and the grit and the gall that those brothers had. And uh, the brothers knew that once they cut that first 25 or 30 million board feet of logs, the, the price would come from $210 a thousand down to $8 a thousand. And that was what they looked forward to. That was their pot of gold at the end of the rainbow was. And they had to get together enough money to get from point A to point B. Well, through the years, uh, Jay Whiting and and A. Milton Mickey Whiting, son of Arthur Whiting, Jay was the son of Ernest, lived in Fredonia, ran the mill. Jay ran the logging woods. Mickey ran the manufacturing part of it. And they became partners and were partners till the day that Jay died. They developed a close relationship, much like the relationship that Art and Ernest had had during their formulative years. And, uh, and most of it dates back to those days in Fredonia. Over the years, as World War II drew to a close, Kayabab Lumber Company became Kayabab Industries. The uh, Whitings got into business in Utah, buying out the Pearson and Croft Mill in Panguitch, Utah, buying out a plating mill in Denver, Colorado, and ended up owning six smaller mills in Colorado. So at one time, Kayabab Industries had three mills in Arizona, had two mills in Utah at Panguitch and one ship, and six mills, smaller mills, in Colorado. So their name was well known in the timber industry. It was no longer a little uh, ragtag lumber company up in the White Mountains. The, uh, at its heyday, Kayabab Lumber Company grew to being able to produce 150 to 170 million board feet of lumber a year compared to the, to the few thousand board feet that Grandpa Edwin Marion produced. Quite a change. The uh, 
through those years, Jay Whiting was primarily in charge of logging and the manufacturing processes. He took a three year leave of absence to go on a mission to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, we, uh, Jay and I divided the responsibilities. I became primarily involved in the, manner, in the political process because it became more and more evident that the environmental pressures were going to cause us not to be able to continue to buy or harvest timber from U.S. Forest Service lands. In so doing, I became quite involved with the National Forest Products Association and spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. under three different presidents. That association was huge. It represented all of the lumber and plywood production in the United States and Canada. So it was no small task. And it was a very political effort. And uh, Jay and I realized that there was going to come a day when the environmental pressures were going to cause us a problem in continuing in the lumber business. Well, that happened. We went on through uh, those years of the 40s and then the 50s and 60s. Uh, when the Endangered Species Act and the environmental legislation took hold, we gradually had to phase out of the lumber and timber business. Our large mill at Fredonia, Arizona, which was a, our crown jewel, was shut down. It was shut down, I can't remember the date. It made national news and uh, we have many fond memories of what we contributed to southern Utah and northern Arizona and the Kaibab Forest. Gradually, the other mills shut down. Today, Kaibab and the Whiting family are no longer in any phase of logging or timber production. Can we stop there for a minute? Yeah. Am I, do you need to cut it off? Are you okay? No, we'll just cut it out when we do it. Yeah, we'll just chop it out. We'll just yeah, okay, the, uh, so I've given you a, a continuation of, of yours yeah. and up to now. Yeah. And then, uh, well, that's it. We're out. We were out, you know, so. Yeah. What year was that? Do you remember? I. I have guessed because I had watched one of those videos, but I couldn't remember what year it was exactly. Well, the fo photos I'm going to give you in a few minutes from my wall oh, okay. has the last log at Fredonia. Okay, and it has the date. And that has the date on it. Okay. So, uh, we did get into the plywood and logging business in Mexico. And that was quite successful, but we sold that mill because we're no longer in the lumber business in the United States. And uh, that operated for about 12 years. But uh, it, the Kayabab and its affiliates and that, no, we still have the name Kayabab Industries today. And uh, my boys and I are primarily involved in that, but it is not a timber lumber operation. It's in real estate and other types of manufacturing. Now I'm assuming Uncle Eddie's family has no more lumber business either. The St. John's, Whiting Brothers of St. John's, gradually they sold their, what was left of their lumber operations to Southwest Forest Industries, who had a large paper mill in Snowflake, Arizona and uh, therefore they had a market to sell out, but they did sell out. Mm -hmm. And so they, Whiting Brothers of St. John's, likewise, 
are not involved in any type of lumber or timber operations. Yeah, that's a sad thing to think all generations of... Well, it's, a, it's amazing that I can tell you this story and not cry. I know. Well, <laughs> we all have a little pickle right here, yeah. so just thinking about it. And oh, our... Sad, sad, tragic. Well, it's so wrong. Yeah, it was just wrong. If, if the timber industry had been allowed to survive and manage the forest, clear the dead and dying timber, these wildflower fires, fires that have been plaguing the Southwest would be under control. Yeah. The North Kaibab, if there was ever a forest fire started, our logging crew was there and had it put out before the sun went down. Even on the other parts of the, the forest, the main defense on firefighting is logging crews, being there with the equipment, know what they're doing. And then keeping the undergrowth and the little timber and that cleared out. That's no longer possible with the Endangered Species Act, which protects the spotted owl and the goshawk and the kayabab squirrel and that. <laughs> and it's so wrong. Yeah. You know, I was talking to my friend Gary Driggs, who had been through some of the same pain and agony with the savings and loan as we went through the timber, and I was on their board. And he said, you know, Mickey, it's so wrong what they did to you. He said, you know, if O.J. Simpson had killed a spotted owl, he'd still be in jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the more <laughs> But anyway, we have tender feelings and great memories of the lumber timber dating back to the days before our time. And I uh, get a lump on my throat when I see the pictures of Grandpa Edward Marion and also of the early days of the log game lumber. Did you remember Edwin Marion? Were you old enough? Yeah, I, uh, I, was, I, I, I went to stay with Edwin Marion and Anna Mariah two or three times when my mother and dad took trips. They went to World's Fair in Chicago and we stayed with them for a week or so and so on. And I happened to be in St. John's the day that Edwin Marion died. I was staying with Jack Albert Brown and I'll never forget Nathel Brown come running toward Aunt Elda's house. Grandpa died. Grandpa died. Grandpa died. So I was old enough for that. I was just, yeah. I was just a little kid. But, uh, but I remember them. Mm -hmm. I remember them. Yeah. But it was your dad that was a fairly young boy at the homestead mills. Yeah. Yeah. And then he had been kind of on his mission while the rest of them were right. doing that yeah. stuff. Yeah. So um, Dad never did work up around the Greens Peak area and that with Timber. He, was, he went straight from his mission to uh, the garage in Holbrook. So he kind of sidestepped that. Yeah, he just got to play in the woods. Yeah, that's so. right. Get bit by dogs and stuff. Get bit by <laughs> dogs, that's right. Yeah. Well, I know Dad had fond memories as a kid living up there when his dad was running the mill. Yeah. The, uh, I couldn't, I'd have to go back and make sure what, what year that was or what time frame that was, but it was a, it was a period before, and then during World War II, and then after World War II that uh, affected the timber industry quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you have any recollection or memory of, you know, when they bought the World War II, the half tracks and stuff to use for skidding up there on the North Kaibab? Uh, do you remember how they came? When, how they decided to try that? No, I know they bid on them. It wasn't just the half tracks. They bid on they bid on some little crawler tractors with a boomman called cherry pickers, mm -hmm. and that's how they loaded the logs. And they could only lift a log about as 
a little bigger than you'd put in your fireplace. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but that was the one thing they bought from the government was uh, those log loaders and they would skid with those little tractors. But the half tracks, uh, that was... It didn't work out as well no, as planned. No, it was, uh, no. It, the mo best thing they worked out for them was to go up to the top of Sierra Tree. Go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Haul up kids and tires. And <laughs> well, the Whitey brothers were an adventurous, <coughs> they were a fearless lot. They didn't... I, I got a... Tell you one story. I don't know if you need to put this in. I want you, but it used to be that the Whiting brothers in Holbrook was the four brothers, including EI. Mm -hmm. He was a partner, and uh, then the Whiting brothers in St. John's was EI and his boys. But the Whiting brothers in Holbrook would have a meeting about once a month, or two months. I don't know, and. Uh, The, uh, they would get E.I. to drive down to the meeting. E.I. was pretty outspoken and domineering, and he was the older brother. So they were having a meeting. I can't remember if it was on the lumber or they were involved in starting those little gas stations along Route 66. But I was old enough that I was in Dad's office listening to him talk, and that was something to behold. <laughs> <laughs> and so I could hear them, uh, each of them cussing and going, and then E.I. would say, well, I don't, I, I don't understand this financial statement. I, I don't understand this statement. You, if I'm going to drive all the way from St. John's, you guys are going to make a statement that I can understand. <laughs> and he did that about eight or ten times, and finally Uncle Ernest says, E.I., I'll make you a statement you can understand. Get the hell back to St. John's. You understand that statement? <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember somebody saying that they used to, you know, Ernest and Art would be in there and they'd be arguing about things <coughs> in their office. But when they walked out of that door, then they were best brothers again. Oh, that, just, you know, then it was all just no problems. They didn't hold I, grudges or get upset. They wouldn't. They were just very opinionated, uh, all of them, but they never did. <laughs> 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 yeah, they were a, a unique breed, a unique generation there, I think. Get the hell back to St. <laughs> I can hear him saying yeah. that. that. That's, that's, that's not out of character for him at all. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, does that give you what you, maybe you need? I or think not? so, because, you know, we'll do a lot of those, the still pictures, and then, um, but it'd be nice to, you know, just ha have, have a little voice, clip a of little. your voice telling some little things here and there. And Well, if you, whatever you need to do between now and then, after you look at this, after you go see what Barry's going to yeah. show you, then if we need to sit down again, now we're not. We have a family reunion coming right, up, right. but that's not till another three weeks from now. So yeah, we'll look at this, and then like if there's a specific question or something we want to have in your words, we could come back and and do that. Okay. But, uh, I think we've got a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Of, you know, in your words of that. Timber sale because I just reread what my dad had written, and uh, you clarified a couple of things that he didn't have in there. Well, I tell you what was ironic. They had looked forward to that sale and they had put got together enough money to do the bid. You had to have opening uh, bid money. When the couriers and their lawyer from Flagstaff showed up. What was ironic is Couriers had been our biggest lumber customer up until then in Detroit. And they walked into that bidding room of that Forest Service, and there was Jerry Courier and his lawyer sitting there. They, what are you doing? <laughs> and, then, and then it was a shootout. That must have been something. I didn't realize that you were 
I was there, but I was... You were pretty young. Well, yeah, I don't even know. I think I was out of high school. I got out of high school in 46 or 7. So you just barely been, yeah, because this was in 46, wasn't it? Yeah, it was right. I just was out of high school. Yeah. I was tagging along. I was yeah. playing. You just went for the ride. 